Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Fundamentalists Podcast. It's an extra early episode for you today, Monday morning, April 13th. Is that what it is? I think so, yeah. What a nightmare. Time yeah. is flying, everybody. We hope you were, uh, had an enjoyable Easter if you didn't see last week's episode. We talked about the meaning of life. It was sort of me interviewing Pete, trying to decipher everything that, that he you know, thinks about things, and it's an excellent episode. It's also an episode where we soft-launched our Patreon, yeah. patreon.com slash the fundamentalists. Thank you to all of you who have signed up already. We have almost made it to the point where we can actually support this, and it won't be losing money, and I think that's pretty exciting, Yeah, Pete. I think it's pretty good. Congratulations. After only two years. <laughs> yeah, it only took two years. Wow. And we're yeah. in the black a little bit, yeah, almost. almost. We're yeah. still in the red, uh, but we'll get there. Uh, but yes, thank you guys, and uh, we're excited to get that thing flushed out and get it looking good and build a little community and make it all very fun but in the meantime we thought we would go back to basics on this particular episode and we would talk about fundamentalism so this is the fundamentalists podcast talking about fundamentalism okay pete is a philosopher or a writer because he doesn't like to be called that i don't think yeah, oh no, we, yeah, we talked about that last week, but it was more just uh, what I meant is just I don't uh, teach philosophy at university. I'm trained as a philosopher, so I am a philosopher, but I don't, uh, I don't teach at a university. Okay. Yeah. I thought maybe you were not wanting to sound like that's a, quite a word to use to describe one's job. Is that right? Freelance philosopher? I'm a bit of a philosopher. <laughs> I'm trained as a philosopher. Uh, and it's lovely. And it's it, it's all going to be very smart. So I'm very excited about it. But Pete has fleshed out some, uh, I think, points on what fundamentalism is, how it's defined. And I have my definition of it. And I'm excited to see how it compares and contrasts with Pete. But first, Pete, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm on a three-day fast. Yeah, you were telling me that because yeah. you, uh, you were having a good birthday week. I was, yeah, I suppose that which was two weeks ago now, but yeah, I did. I felt that I'd been eating too much, drinking too much. I felt I was lacking focus. And then, so I woke up yesterday and thought, I'm just going to take a break from eating. And the whole day went by and I went, oh, that was actually, I felt good for it. So I'm going to do three days to kickstart kind of more focus and uh, get fitter again because now the gym's open. Nice. Um, all of that. So I thought, I'll give the it a go. The exercise, man, that's the best, it's the best thing for, uh, Feeling happy, I think, just yeah. a little bit. Although I have to, I I pretend that I like it. I don't really like it. But what I do is I, I wake up and go, oh, this will, I'll feel great. This will be really nice. But I hate it. Really. I did it this yeah. morning. And I, uh, before I came over here, I was like, I'm going to get up early. I'm going to work out. I'm going to go to Pete's. We're going to knock out this podcast. I'm going to go home, get school stuff done. It's going to be wonderful. And then when that alarm went off, I was like, I, I hate this so much. But you enjoy getting up early. At oh, least. yeah. I love getting up early. Uh, that's my thing. Are you thinking I went about to the cinema yesterday, by the way. Really? On my own. I just was sitting there and going like, there's a cinema around the corner. I thought, I wonder if it's open. And it was open. And wow. I went to see a movie. Cool. Yeah, what? that was really nice. What? I was basically the only one in the theater. Yeah. Yeah. What movie did you see? So I went to see The Marksman. Which I thought was another movie. I, there's a you movie it was called about the, Karl Marx, didn't you? Yes, yeah, that's right. It was waiting for some good <laughs> some communism, but no. Nope. <laughs> I thought it was. There's a movie called Wrath of Man that's coming out, and I saw a trailer for it, and I thought it looked fun. And for some reason, I got the wrong movie. So I sat down and I was going, like, I don't know anything about this movie at all yeah uh the only thing i knew five minutes before was that liam neeson was in it who's from northern ireland i'll do um and uh watch it it was fine it was, yeah it was I mean, it was nice to watch a big movie and yeah it was cool kind of like a buddy road trip movie so um you got out yeah you went into the world yeah that was nice wow. you did you went into the world you went for a hike i did go for a hike yeah yeah that was really amazing yeah and we were just talking before we hit record how i think i've lost all like ability to have conversations <laughs> with, uh, with people and to the point where i was just like in my head going like i know I know there's like a rhythm that you get into when you're speaking with someone, like when you have a conversation, but I couldn't find it. Yeah. I felt like I had like, <laughs> my instrument was not tuned to properly. And I was just like, this is coming off. I, am I coming off like a psycho? I feel like I was coming off like, uh, I have no idea. I couldn't answer basic questions, but it was all very fun. And uh, the hike was very pleasant. And it was also just, you know, it's funny people. Um, some of these people that are, that I know, um, you know, they're funny. They're funny people. And that makes yeah. hiking pretty nice when you have people who have a sense of humor about it and aren't like, here we go. Yeah. It makes it nice. Uh, was it a, was it a hike hike? Uh, Cause when I hear the word hike, I think of something pretty strenuous, 
pretty rough now. No, it was like a big trail. Like you know, uh, in Burbank, there's those hills, and you just enjoy. I mean, it, it it's strenuous. Yeah, but it's not like when I imagine a hike, I imagine like trees all around and a little uh, trail, and like you got sticks, and you're like yeah. going over rocks. Yeah, not really that. It's just like dirt roads all the way up, but it's really pretty. Yeah, nice. Um, By anyway. the way, do you remember the first time we? landed on the name the fundamentalists yeah we were at that tiki bar yeah that's right and we uh were talking about how lots of podcasts have names that try to really define what they are and we yeah. thought we'd pick a name that is kind of like more provocative yeah because we were at tiki no um which is a tiki bar in north hollywood that uh oh goodness talk about places on the bucket list when the time is right i'm coming yeah. back tiki no but um mm. Yeah, we were there because, yeah, we wanted to name it something that was uh, sounded like, had an ist at the end, which we not liked. And then, yeah, Fundamentalist was like the one that we, it was one of those ones where it was like, okay, this makes the most sense. But what I'm interested in too, uh, about it, and I, what I think is very ironic about our, the title of this podcast, is that fundamental, I, I feel like I get fairly fundamentalist about things fairly often, even though it's an ironic title. I think you have beliefs and, and ideas that you are steadfast in, mm. but you wouldn't say that's fundamentalism. You would just say, but, but when I think fundamentalism, I go, that means someone thinks that they're right and everyone else is wrong. But I think that all the time about everybody. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I like about it, actually, this is good, um, that the reason why I liked it was because we live in a society, a very strong... We live in a society. We do, there Thank you go. You. <laughs> and I blame society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we live in a kind of a, a re religious revival of purity culture, you know, so we, we are pure, the other's impure, and religion's always been connected with purity culture. And we always try to identify ourselves as pure and the other as impure. And I really like... It, funnily enough, one of the first critiques of purity culture was the Apostle Paul, who said... Uh, he called his community the, the I think, basically the shit of the world or the, the refuge and the trash of the world. So he self-identified his own community as dirty, as, 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 pro, as, as having problems within it. So by, by identifying as a fundamentalist, I like because that word is such a negative word mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that people always yep. say the other's fundamentalist that I, I kind of like the idea of claiming it and saying, yeah, there's a fundamentalism within us all. And actually... If we can see our own impurities, perhaps that's the way to escape fundamentalism. So bizarrely, by embrace, by seeing it within yourself, is perhaps the way of breaking its hold. Yeah. So the fundamentalist there you go. So I felt we were identifying with something impure. Um, I like how you really got this back on track there for a second. I was really uh, going off about that hike for a second. Oh, yeah, hi, that was great. I no, really cool. <laughs> I started falling asleep again as I was talking about it. Um, You're just wrecked because it's so early in the morning. No, how no, often nice. do you get up at this I time? I exercise. I'm good. I'm good. But right? I also take pre-workout before I exercise. So God knows when that's going to crash. The pre you do a pre-workout uh, powder. That I put in water. That, oh, a uh, powder? Oh, a pre-workout pre powder? Pre-workout mix, yeah. Oh, right. And then I, I drink that and then... About 20 minutes later, I'm screaming and I'm jumping all around. And then, uh, yeah, I, I kind of write it down for the rest of the day. Yeah. So. That's just your morning routine. And after you've <laughs> yeah. screamed and cried, you then, then work I out. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So fundamentalism. Fundamentalism. Okay. Let's dive in. <clears throat> so I was thinking, I was thinking of two things. For me, fundamentalism, and see what you think of this. We can work through it and see, and see what your definition is. But is, I think fundamentalism is connected to ideology and idolatry which both come from the same root Greek word, eidos, eidos or eidos, which means, I mean, well, we can dive into what it means, but I think fundamentalism is a deployment of um, ideology um, and idolatry, which is a way of um, covering over or avoiding ontological antagonism. Okay. We're going to need to back up and we're going to need to... We're going to need to review that and break those down, a lot of those words down. Because I tell you, there are certain words that I know the meaning of, and I know I know the meaning of, but then when I hear them, it's like like ontological is the idea of knowing. It, that's how you're being, gaining knowledge. Well, actually, being ontology is the nature of being. So if you talk about what is... Okay, I got it wrong. Yeah. 
Like, well, you know, well, yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> what word was well, I thinking of? Ideological? Oh, um, uh, epistemology. Epistemology. Epistemology is theory of knowledge, yeah, yeah. So, this, so ontology is even more basic than epistemology. Um, ontology is, when you talk about ontology, you're talking about what the essence of a being is or Love. a being itself. Okay. And so when I say ontological antagonism, what, I, what I'm meaning is that at the level of reality itself, there is a type of oscillation, there's a type of contradiction, and we and fundamentalism is an attempt to avoid confronting that, mm -hmm. and that's what ideology is, and that's what I would say I idolatry is. Those two words are used to, and there I would we should break them down a little mm -hmm. bit, but but in a nutshell, I would say both of those terms describe a hiding of something hidden. They are they they attempt to to hide a lack. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. That so, I agree. And, and do you remember the word, the, it's root, the, the Greek word? Eidos. Eidos. And what is that? So, eidos. which means idea. What's where the free word idea right. comes from or form. So Plato used it to mm -hmm. talk about the forms. So basically it's the, the shadows idea. on the wall. Yes. And, sp and then, but then getting beyond, yeah, the, getting outside the cave and seeing the kind of like getting behind the curtain. Yeah. Right? That was kind of like the, and that's why ideology is a little bit about that. It's about ideas that purport to give you the insight into how reality works cool um but the word has changed a lot over time um so it started off meaning just ideas I, your ideology is your way of looking at the world and then with marx and Engels, it became the idea that ideology was anything that hid the material circumstances of the world so ideology was basically was the idea that ideas are where the action is. And, yeah. uh, and it covered over class antagonisms and conflicts, and they were materialists, so the material factors of reality. Then after that, ideology became, kind of developed into the notion that ideology with Shizek is an attempt to avoid a confrontation with the ultimate contingency of reality. So ideology is what gives us a sense of meaning and stability mm -hmm. and the way things are the way things should be um and that kind of develops and so you know. that that what's what's the difference between what zizek is saying and what yeah, marx and marx the other and, ones okay yeah so that um so so marx is basically saying that what the real engine of change in the world is material circumstances yeah uh, the, how we produce things how we barter how we exchange so that's and everything else is covers over that so religion maybe says this is the way things are supposed to be the rich man on his castle the poor man on his gate god made them high and lowly and ordered their estate right from the hymn all things bright and beautiful so religion basically tries to cover over the the true material circumstances which is just some people have stuff some people don't and the the conflicts She's like, it goes, None of that matters because you just got to believe this idea yeah. as long as you get this thing, no matter what it is, even if it's not religious, even if it's political, you gotta, if you believe this thing the right way, then you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And also, and, and everything that's happening is the way it should happen. And so that's just how it is. That's how it is. Because you got to think about the idea. Yeah. Well, if you believe in the idea, of course it's going to happen. Yeah, like almost behind the scenes, God or nature or fate dictates this. So if you have a yeah. true insight, so education and maybe, so the educational system, the judicial system, the religious system, insofar as they're ideological, are kind of saying, oh, the way things are at the moment is the way they should be. It's the way, it's... It's just the way the universe or God or nature dictates reality. Was um, So Marx was against ideology? Yes. So he was but ideology critique. That sounds pretty ideological to be like all of the ideology is just yeah. masking over the class system, the classes. Isn't that the same thing? You're just sort of reshuffling the deck a little bit? Uh, you know, you, you maybe could argue there, that that could be an ideology, but the, what he would say is that um, ideology is what makes temporal contingent reality into something eternal. Mm. So he would say, like anything that exposes the the conflicts within society and the and the fact the historicity of things that everything is moving, changing. That we can imagine new worlds. That there are different ways of configuring reality. Marx would say that is ideology critique. Something that keeps you away from that. Something something that you something that keeps you away from the idea that the way things are 
or the way they have to be. Yeah, yeah. okay. That covers over everything and says, listen, it, almost even today, it's like saying that the system is, is fine. It's just there's a few little problems. We get few, rid of the few little problems and it yeah. continues to function. Marx would say that's ideology. So ideology critique or what's called historical materialism is the notion that you see the conflicts and the historicity mm-hmm. of reality. Yeah, you know, okay. But you could, but, 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 but you know, you're saying, but yeah, what about, is that not an ideology? No, no, yeah. I think that, and then would that be a, but I guess, would that be, that wouldn't be fundamentalism then? Ye, no, although I think it's connected. So fundamentalism is a type of ideology. Yeah. I mean, We're like, getting there, folks. Yeah. Because I'd almost want to make a distinction between secular fundamentalism and sacred fundamentalism. So for me, secular fundamentalism is ideological. And sacred fundamentalism is idolatry. Yeah, yeah, I see. What so, you're um, so, but but the funny thing is, w- what happened after Marx for Sh- with Shizek mm-hmm. through a guy called Alta- Altazer is the idea that ideology functions. Altazer is the vaccine I got. Oh, is that? Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> um, ideology kind of ultimately functions to cover over. The, cent- the central antagonisms within culture. So, it, so the, ultimately, we don't want to face um, the contingency of reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How Which it's is very all similar. messed up. It's all messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very. It kind of comes out of the same kind of root, um, but it's slightly different because it brings in this concept of the real. Which is so in in traditional Marxism, you you have this tendency of thinking that there is a non-antagonistic future, communism. There's a way of getting to a future that where antagonism doesn't exist. Utopia. Yeah, a utopia. And Shizek is very critical of that utopic thinking. He says, no, that, that, that itself is ideology. Ideology always has a vision of some non-antagonistic reality where everything's great as long as we get rid of a certain group of people yeah. or a certain group of ideas. Um, Could you extend that to, um, you know how... Uh, not going to name names, but yeah. some people at the end of the day will have a lot of drinks uh, and it becomes like they have so many drinks that they're wanting also to escape the contradiction and yeah. the reality of life. Yeah. And it's still the same because you're, you're still trying to, you're still going, there's a utopia. If I can just get out of my brain a little bit, then yeah. I'll be happy. I mean, yeah, I, th- I mean, I think kind of at its root alcoholism you will it's often spirit. find is what's that? They're spirits. They're spirits, <laughs> and and you'll find at the very core of it, um, often yeah, a, a, some trauma that the person's trying to get away from, something, some antagonism mm-hmm. that they're trying to cover over. I think most addictions are that. Yeah. And the difference between an addiction and not an addiction is you can have a few drinks because you want to you want to relax, but if you are, if you have this compulsion. Right, right to drink that to get to get away from the contradiction get to that utopia yeah to get that just get rid of the the, the complexity of, of life yeah. do you think that we're living in an era of fundamentalists yeah well, fund, i think there's a revival of secular fundamentalism secular, fundamental. yeah. Sec, secular purity culture yeah it's very religious because religion has always been connected with what's dirty and what's clean what's pure and what's impure so Religions have always been kind of both literally and and uh, metaphorically, yeah. And um, also, religion at its at its most mature has always been a critique of purity culture. Always saying that hold on, maybe you're maybe the dirt's within you, mm-hmm. not within the other. And so I do see kind of ideology. We live in an age of ideology and the age of purity culture. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's definitely religion is alive and well. Uh, it is, and it, it's an it's an unfortunate situation. Now, it, it, are there different kinds of fundamentalism? We've talked yeah. about previously about doing multiple episodes on the fundamentalism of certain things, looking at the ways that these things could be viewed through a fundamentalist lens uh, or critiqued in that way. Um, how how far does this go? I mean, you can't really get rid of this. You can't you can't escape it. It's going to be in everything. Yeah. Right. Like, there's no way you can not be a little bit. Otherwise, what you you have to stand for something at some point. You have to be like, this is what I think is going to help the world. Therefore, this I'm gonna do, and it's still in doing that. You're 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 banking on like a utopia in some way because you're banking on at least improvement. Yeah. Well, see, so yeah. So the, the way out potentially here's what I would say: the way out is, is yeah, there's no way out. But weirdly, as you embrace that there's no way out, that's the escape. So it's like purely, it's like whenever you begin to see. For example, if you're 
projecting all of your inner darkness onto somebody else. And then you begin to say, oh my goodness, I'm projecting that. That's partly within me. You're not escaping it, but by coming to know it, by coming to symbolize it, by coming to put it into language, um, you find a certain purchase on it, a certain freedom from it. That's why I like that we call ourselves a fundamentalist, because weirdly, by by identifying with it, you uh, subvert it. Yeah, you that, make, yeah, yeah, yeah. You rob rob it of its power. You make yeah. it from unconscious to conscious. Bring it to the surface. Yeah. And, and yeah, and ultimately, kind of for me, it's like and see that antagonism. That's always that's the core of my work. Is like that we somehow can like that the, most of the damage that's done in society is precisely because we want to avoid the lack. We want to avoid this black hole within yeah. us and within society. And actually, that's what causes all the problems. And we buy and we buy and we buy. Yeah, and purchasing is a kind of way of. Always trying to think the next thing's going to fill the lack, fill yeah. the gap, fill the hole. You know, I've been on this real kick lately, Pete, with uh, these these tuna products. Mm. Now, I don't mean to talk about food on a day that you're fasting, <laughs> uh, but I hope this isn't appetizing to you at all. I like them. They come in little cups. It's really easy for me to consume. It's a tiny little bit of tuna. It's like tuna in- intimations or something like that. And it's weird mm. imaginations, some kind of I word. Uh and I buy them off of Amazon like a psychopath. Uh, and I buy them m- m- a couple cases at a time. I do something similar with these little uh, little shots of just vegetables yeah. and stuff. So you buy their little... Yeah, they come in cardboard and they're single, boxes. they're single serve. But then, so I'm enjoying these. I'm like, this is a nice, like, like modest snack slash lunch during the day yeah. when I don't want to It gives it. you the illusion that it's fixing all of the vices that you have. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. This will solve it. This too. Yeah. <laughs> well, wouldn't you know it? I turn on this documentary called Seaspiracy. Oh. Which a friend of it a friend said right it up your called. street. <laughs> yeah. So exa- I was like, I love both of those words smashed together. I love the sea and I love conspiracies. Uh, but a friend of a friend said it should be conspiracy, like conspira, S E A. Anyway, uh, that's a different podcast. Uh. But uh, it was the whole documentary was just like, you can't eat fish anymore. Don't ever eat fish. <laughs> and I was like, crap. I got really into this fish. And now I know if I just keep eating the fish, I'm going to get tired of the tuna. And I'm going, I'm going to, because that's what I do. I'll get one type of thing and I'll eat it for like a couple weeks. And then I get bored and I move on to the next thing. So I'm going to get naturally in due time, we'll start eating less tuna. But the whole thing was like, yeah, you just, you want to save the planet, you just stop eating fish. Like above everything else, they went into the plastic straw thing, they went into the recycling thing, they went into like, cars and like what's causing the most damage and then they went and they you know looked at the fishers fisheries across the globe and i was like okay so all we have to do is stop eating fish and we will have a utopia is that right because we i guess we are just we are i mean we are just sucking the sea dry of like fish are we we're just going through are we we're going through a lot of fish yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I, I kind of seen some some of those stats it seems like a lot it seems like a yeah. lot of fish yeah. yeah i'm doing my part uh <laughs> and i feel bad about it but uh it was definitely one of those things where i was like i i there's so few things that i just compulsively buy a lot of but tuna happened to have become one of them, and I was like, mm, "All right." I but guess. jellyfish is it not true that we we have to learn how to eat jellyfish because there's so many of those. Really? But is yeah, but most is? people don't like to eat jellyfish. There are some countries and where some people eat jellyfish. Really? Yeah. Ugh. There's yeah, I, yeah. It doesn't sound nice to me, but there are some. Uh, I think somewhere in Asia, there's some. It's a delicacy in some places, and I'm sure they do it nicely. But basically, I was reading. We're going, to like, we're going to have to all learn to like jellyfish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to have to figure this out pretty soon. We're going to start eating jellyfish. So what's the conspiracy, by the way, of the sea? What, is there... um, it's, all the, it's all the tuna organic um, crap. Oh, yeah. It's all like the organic thing is a complete oh, yeah. racket, especially in that area. And then he like tracks who owns the companies that are doing the fish and how they're all connected. They're all owned by the same people. And then they have like stamps that they sell that say like, you know, fresh, uh, like farm fresh or something like that. And it never is. They oh, just yeah, sort yeah. of like they, they make money off of these is branding links. It's very interesting. I know very little about any of that stuff. So I'm always just like, whatever the thing is going to be. This is why also I don't tend to watch documentaries about food. If I had I known this was going to be about food, I yeah. probably wouldn't have done it. I don't like watching Super Size Me. I don't like knowing what's in the Big Mac. I don't like getting my tr- 
creature comforts taken away from me. Yeah. And this is a very small, you know, stupid thing to complain about, but it reminded me when you were talking about consuming, 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 and trying to fill the hole constantly. I was like, oh yeah, we are just destroying everything too yeah. in the process. And that 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 is a good way of thinking about what commodity fetishism is. Because commodity fetishism is the idea that you think I have a, fe- a tuna fetish? A tuna fe- you've got a, you've got a tuna <laughs> fetish. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's like in, in commodity fetishism, the idea of fetish and religion is a, an object that you create. You, you make the God, and then you think that the God has just appeared. And you're, f- so it's kind of, it it's connects actually with fundamentalism as this idea of ideology. Is for Marx, we create the world. But then when we create the world, we then start to think that that creation is eternal and comes, you know, we experience it from outside of ourselves. And commodity fetishism is that we go into a supermarket and we see commodities and they seem these magical things that just appear in supermarkets that you just buy and there you, you consume the tuna. But actually that's conceals all of these relations that go that span thousands of people all around the world it never ends never ends it has all these connections but when we don't know that we can consume these we treat it as this fetish object that's just a magical thing the car is just there but actually we're divorced from seeing all of the social relations all of the all of the also the 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 people who have been exploited or whatever in in that chain and so documentaries like that they just expose the truth that that this little tin that you've got is actually connected with uh, the uh, end of the world yeah, it doesn't seem to <laughs> it doesn't taste as good yeah. since i watched the documentary yeah. but the problem is that'll be the same with your shirt that'll be the same with this chess set it'll be the same with these microphones in you the gotta sense choose of like, something you know because yeah. yeah if you i know that argument of like i mean everything is your iPhones, that's a big one. Yeah. Oh, no, but, I, but I'm the opposite. I'm going like, we, we need to know. Like, I'm going like, we, let's expose. Just look how, at it, yeah. Yeah, like, let's, let's begin. Because if you actually, and it's very hard to do, but if you actually see all of the, all of that complexity, it kind of sickens you of the whole thing. You start to wonder, oh, is there a different way of us relating and purchasing and, and yeah. doing so, you know, and you start to, you start to think about different ways of doing work. But until you see it, you don't start to imagine different ways. Yeah, is hmm, could I order from I don't know anyone other than Amazon? Like, is there <laughs> uh, maybe a better company <clears throat> out there? Not that they're not incredible. <clears throat> Did you see what they were doing with that Amazon news account? No, what happened? That was some insane stuff, dude. They're on Twitter like blasting Bernie <clears throat> Sanders from the verified, excuse me, verified Amazon news account is that, that right? says Amazon news, and they're like mocking him and uh, like replying to him and and. And sticking up for like and being like our employees love this that none of this is true this is silly. oh I heard about that and Bernie yeah. Sanders what has he ever done with it? and it was just so weird because it was like the handle it was just weird seeing Amazon News the handle like getting pithy with people yeah crazy yeah, yeah. well yeah all these corporations are um, you know they're all I would say they're all woke washing which is like do they they're all jumping on what what the current ideology is yeah but yeah. they get very nervous when you actually hit on the actual oppressions right <laughs> that, yeah. that are existing you know and uh yeah because that has to be rein hidden like it, it all of that oppression has to be under the surface it has when you get into an uber you do want to see bottles of urine right that's the thing that has yeah. to be hidden um and when Not it's, unless they're mine yeah <laughs> exactly I'm bringing them with me <laughs> yeah so yeah it's uh it's all hidden yeah, it's all hidden. Yeah, it's um, uh, the the yeah. I know, man. That tuna now just doesn't. It hits different. Yeah, uh, but it's incredible how quick we can forget. Like, I mean, we all live within the. So it's it's not. A, that's what I mean. There's like there's no outside of the system. So mm-hmm. I'm very critical of. The, there's the, the idea with Altazair, which is um, by merely not identifying with the system, is the is is a is a act of resistance, which I think is interesting. Is where basically you you don't. You don't you don't respond to the ideology. You try to kind of like uh, uh, live outside of it in some respects, but there is no outside of it. You know that, but yeah. but, there, but there is a way somehow of like this is why I'm a Hegelian. It's like for me the 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 political act is exposing the horror of everything, not not so much what the next step is, just expose. Mm-hmm. the reality for what it is you just have to look at the vomit a little bit yeah it's like there's poop in, on the living room floor and we're all walking around every day pretending that there's not poop in the living yeah. room floor and we just need to look at it and be like someone needs to clean this up 
Yeah. But then you find out that there's poop in every room. And then you find out that the walls are made of poop. And then you find out that, you know, even the water is coming out brown. It's crazy. Sorry, that's just getting gross. Yeah. But and then the, um, and the problem with ideology is ideology, and this is what Todd McGowan talks about, but I, for him, ideology is what always provides a way of explaining of kind of like uh, justifying, almost? justifying, yeah, rationalizing. justifying, rationalizing, and, and rendering contingent, saying that, um, and and kind of like offering fake solutions. You're kind of repressing it, yeah. You're just yeah. going like you can you can look the other way, and you can pretend everything's fine, mm-hmm. and no one will ever bother you. Yeah, yeah. And this and is why if someone you know, does, you just go, well, you do it too. Yeah, yeah. And fundamental. This is why fundamentalism in its religious and secular form so. Um, appealing because it offers us a way of either avoiding a confrontation with these antagonisms or a way of like uh, giving us an easy solution to yeah them. Uh, yeah rather than seeing them as um, okay inherent to the system this is a this is a difficult thing because like every, every system has an inherent antagonism that if you get rid of it you destroy the system itself and so in political theory, the idea is that if you want to create a new system, you have to hit the central antagonism of the current system. You have to expose it, bring it to light. It becomes so distasteful to so many people, it, that system collapses and something mm-hmm. new arises. Um, that's kind of the, the Hegelian kind of... You're really smart, Pete. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's really smart stuff. But in terms of fundamentalism, yeah, maybe that's a... You know, people think of it in terms of religion. And That's the other thing too I like about the the you know it, the podcast is it is uh, not <clears throat> typically about super religious things. It kind of mixes in and then it gets mostly some kind of loosely political and philosophical and covering all these things. It's very nice, but yeah, I don't think of it that way. I yeah. mean, it, the people um, <clears throat> I've heard stories like they're the the old school kind of fundamentalist. Uh, group is still out there that that you know is in the south and in certain parts of the country and it's still very prevalent and i've heard recent tales of uh of those sorts of communities and they do seem now so foreign uh to me that it's almost weird it's it's like an alternate reality a little bit when i hear these tales but i was like I, I still wouldn't define the majority of uh, when I think the word fundamentals, I think of people who I see in uh, L.A., which is uh, of an incredibly, I would say, fundamentalist uh, religious place just yeah. without the churches. And it's more just a, a strange like, um, I mean, but what do I know anymore anyway? I got I haven't been out there. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we've all just grown up and changed, and everyone's going to be really chill and laid back. But I doubt it. Yeah. If there's one thing I know about LA, it's going to be a little. It's going to be interesting. Well, I went to a, I went to a party a week ago or two weeks ago with a, and it was um, a lot of young LA kind of entrepreneurs, and um, I was very interested in how much ideology was in that space yeah <laughs> um but for marx interestingly in his um uh, he wrote a famous uh piece called um the critique of hegel's philosophy of right an introduction to the critique of hegel's philosophy of right and that's where the famous line religion is the opiate of the people mm. comes from but in that he starts it off saying um the critique of religion is the beginning of all critique and what he means is that 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 um, fundamentalism doesn't go away when you critique it it just becomes secular and so there's notions that are in religion filter it into secular society and those have to be critiqued so the for me there's definitely still religious fundamentalism but it just doesn't have as much power yeah as was, but because I- idolatry is the notion of a god that you can see that you can hold in your hand that that is the essence that covers over this traumatic real of god the yeah. kind of the unnameable the one that you can't have a grave an image of and so yeah if, if religious fundamentalism is just a clear way of seeing secular fundamentalism because in religious fundamentalism god gets rid of all antagonism god says god is the way to go well it might be shit at the moment but it'll be better in the next life or the way of saying well the way of the world is it's yeah it it's doesn't temporary. get rid of the 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 contradiction but so but yeah because it's still going you're suffering yeah but so, yeah. it'll be okay it's, it still gives you a narrative a yes. meta narrative 
it just gives, yeah. give meaning when yeah okay exactly and that's what marx means by the opiate of the people because he says like religion is the opiate of the people instagram the is the opiate of the people oh yeah yeah absolutely it is now but yeah. he says it's the heart of a heartless world the soul of a soulless condition and then he says Insta. um uh yeah the oh, sorry, twitter twitter is that twitter <laughs> and he says um it's and then he goes on to say that it's the encyclopedia of the human condition something similar to that but what he's but it's beautiful it's a beautiful line like the soul yeah. of a soulless condition the heart of a heartless world like he, he and then he says he says we must it, it's the oh he says it's the imaginary flowers on the chains of our oppression and he says we must get rid of the imaginary flowers not so that we see the chains in despair but so that we can see the chains, break them, and pick living flowers. So for, for Marx, religion wasn't bad. Like it, 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 it was an opiate, it was a painkiller. It helped us deal with our suffering, just like getting drunk can help us deal with our suffering. The only problem is that it covers over the oppression. It doesn't help us actually see it and, and break free from it. And basically, imaginary flowers are always nicer than real flowers. The only problem is you can't pick them, you can't smell them, you can't mm -hmm. you can't hold them. So it's like um, that. And so you ask, you ask, what is the opiate so, of today? Yeah, yeah. So when was he around? This Marx guy? What was it? Eighteen forties to nineteen. And then or whatever. Yeah. Right? So he that that's coming off of uh, what do you got? 200, 300, 400 years of the. Uh, about 300 of the, like the Protestant Reformation and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess so from Luther, yeah. So that's only two generations, two or three genera three or four generations, I guess. No, it was a generation, 20 years. I mean, like, his great-granddad was probably, he knew about all that. He was yeah. there for that. And he, and he was very, I mean, Marx will have, yeah, that, I mean, that whole, funny, Feuerbach, who's very, who was a very big Lutheran, was influenced Marx. So it kind of comes out of that Protestant kind of like yeah. Reformation kind of tradition. Why, what are you thinking about that? I like, was thinking about, well, I mean, Jung talks about the Protestant Reformation or the pro the proliferation of Protestants following the, the Protestant Reformation and the sort of how they, um, it, they kind of compared to the Catholic Church uh, kind of fell apart and just in terms of, once there was no centralized belief system that everyone was sort of a part of, and that then Protestants went off and just became a billion different groups, all mm. with different, I, we disagree here on this little thing and here on this little thing. And I, I think the argument is something like it just basically, it, it, it helped push forward the, the lack of sa satisfaction or uh, potency that religion had uh, prior. Uh. And so then everything his whole thing was like this just isn't working for people anymore like people aren't aren't going to church that doesn't they're not getting what they uh in antiquity may have been able to get out of it because it's just not there anymore and uh and so yeah that's what oh, I was yeah. about. very good and yeah and there's a, there's a sense in which protestantism secularized in a very big way that um catholicism didn't so much is that from luther uh, you have then Hegel, and Hegel basically philosophizes theology. So he basically, Hegel makes uh, uh, the crucifixion of Christ into a philosophical concept. Yeah. And then after Hegel, you go into Feuerbach, who secularizes L Lutheran theology, and then Marx. Um, and then, you know, you've also got Nietzsche in there mm -hmm. as a kind of secular Protestant. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it is interesting. Protestantism has had a massive effect on philosophy. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Hegel's kind of partly responsible, and Marx is in that line. Cool. Yeah. I need to read Hegel. I need to get. I need to do it, but I'm not going to do it uh, right now. You're doing a lot of reading. What are you? What are you reading at the moment? I'm reading about complexes, and I'm reading about archetypes. Mm. The complexes are very interesting, and no pun intended, slightly complex. Yeah. Learn about object relations theory. Ah, yep. That was really interesting. <clears throat> um, theory of emotions, where emotions come from. Um, difference between Freudian schools of thought being that emotion comes from ego. And then <clears throat> depth psychology saying emotions come from complexes, unconscious complexes, and they get constellated from the unconscious. So they spring forth, they act as autonomous, uh, almost like splinter psyches, as uh, Jung said. And so learning about all the different ways complexes happen, and then in the context of depth psychology, how multiple complexes can be activated at the same time, and what's going on there, and where you, when you're actually seeing someone as someone or as they are, 
uh, to the best of your ability, or you're seeing them from, you know, whatever you're projecting onto them, which is most commonly how you find out what your complexes are. Okay. So the funny thing is, so complex is a word that's more Jungian word. So it's actually not a word that I come across much. How would you define complex? Is it, I wonder a if it's a feeling similar to toned something. group of, um, a feeling toned, uh, reaction toward, uh, or, um, a bundle. Yeah. It's like a archetypally based, uh, constellated behaviors, emotionally toned behaviors that happen as a result of, um, usually they have a trauma at their core. So if you're in a complex, you, you know, Oh, I don't know what got into me. I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I said that. I don't know who I was just there. You're not you when you're hungry. That kind of thing is an indicator that you're in a complex because you sort of, your ego kind of takes a back seat to the complex and you kind of lose yourself in the moment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's funny. Like, um, cause I've read a bit of Jung, but I, yeah, complex is just not a word that's used much in psychoanalysis. No, and it's, I, and, yeah. it's not <clears throat> Freud, I guess used it, liked it, but then mm-hmm. kind of kind of got away from it yeah. real quick. And then Freud said dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. And then Jung was like, no complexes are the royal road to the, the unconscious. And their idea is that complexes, uh, even though he says it's not a royal road, it's a very tumultuous, uh, twisting path and very hard. But he, and then he says, complexes basically are the uh block the building blocks of the unconscious okay <clears throat> okay so because yeah okay i'm gonna need we'll need to talk more but we should do an episode on complexes because i'd like to and i'll do some reading on it cause, yeah know, i'm kind of new to it i can it, give but. you some stuff to read because it's really interesting but it's it, some of it is some of it i don't um totally uh agree with it seems like a really heavy emphasis on complexes but at the same time, um, it also, a lot of it makes a ton of sense. And they're, they're also saying like, uh, basically this is me rambling, sorry, but the complexes are like a, uh, constantly amorphous and changing and the theory on it is changing and there's no like set theory. And so it's a lot of, uh, simultaneous ideas at once kind of hitting okay, yeah. me, but, um, I want you to send you, there's one particular paper I really liked. I really like the one on emotions, um, and that was interesting because it was just very like he cuts the graph, he makes a little graph and it just sort of shows, you know, the 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 ego kind of dip down when the energy of the complex rises. It gets activated by whatever, you know, your partner doesn't do the dishes, that kind of thing. OK, because it sounds like it sounds like what would be called what in psychoanalysis might be called um, uh, compulsion repetition or something. Or repetition compulsion. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the ones that they, yeah, they mentioned that in one yeah. of the things, um, repetition yeah. compulsion. And yeah, it's, you keep doing the same thing and you yeah. find yourself in these same type and they can never go away. A complex can never like, you can't just recognize it, recognizing it doesn't do anything. So you have to basically free the libido from the complex that has been stored up into something else which would be, I guess, sublimation, if we're talking in that realm. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes, this does have, like, similarities then to... I can, I'm starting to be able to place it. And, yeah. Yeah, what I know. Um, yeah, because I know that... Yeah, and then the... Yeah, we can talk about all that in a separate thing, but it's... I have to go read more of it today and uh, and talk about it. And, Cause, uh, yeah, because the, the funny thing is, from psychoanalytic perspective, your... This kind of repetition compulsion is... Um, is exactly where your freedom is, which I find fascinating. So like in in philosophy, they talk about positive and negative freedom. And so positive freedom is the idea that your desire is is not, um, is internally generated. It's not, it doesn't come from an external chain mm-hmm. of events. And then negative freedom says that, well, no, your desire is, is to do with all of these, a chain of cause and effects. But what freedom is, is simply, can you act on your desire? So if you're a, if you're a, a monk and you put yourself in a cell um, and the cell door is locked, you can't get out, but you're free because you don't want to get out. Your desire is to stay in the cell. So you, whereas if you want to get out and you can't, you're not free. Yeah. But in psychoanalysis, you have in uh, this notion that your freedom is precisely. Uh, the the eruption of something that de- destabilizes you mm-hmm. um this that so it's weirdly the thing that you feel most unfree the thing that comes up that is that you think is least you is actually the evidence of your freedom so it's a uh, it's fascinating that's ex- yeah, yeah. yeah that's very 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 similar to um a lot of what the papers i was reading i mean it's hard to keep track of it 
of it because I just go through and I highlight things and I move on and I highlight and I move on. But um, the, yeah, uh, it was making a whole case about like, and you said this too, like the complexes are, are a sign that you, that something is up that you can actually grapple with and people freak out about them and no one likes to look at their complexes. No one likes to think they have an inferiority complex or mother complex or any of that stuff. Uh, but when you recognize it and you start working with it, then yeah, I mean, it's not, it's basically going, you can experience some version of freedom and some version of a new life after yeah. that. Very good. It's okay. nice. Nice, nice. It's all very fun. Yeah. So here, what uh, you're saying about your thoughts on fundamentalism, did you have a definition or a kind of feel? Because you grew up in a kind of... Did, yeah, I mean... Did, I, would I, you say you grew up in a fundamentalist environment? Evangelical, so yeah. I guess fundamentalist. Is that... Yeah, pretty fundamentalist. Can be, yeah. I think sometimes it... it, it, it not necessarily, but I think to be honest, yeah, generally. Yeah. I went to... Um, there was a couple of years I went to a really Baptist school mm. uh, for as a kid, and I was like in fourth and fifth grade, and that was pretty wild. Those people were fundamentalists. Oh, yeah. um, for sure. But I still... I, I, don't, I don't know that I even worry too much about the religious aspect anymore, like the, the sort of different things, because I, I feel like that's... Um, I almost feel like that's better than than a lot of the fundamentalism that I see. I mean, I know I'm just closer to it out here, and it's it's too much. But it's um, yeah, I get more worried about it out here. It, for me, I view fundamentalism as a uh, I know it when I see it. It's that person that's on Twitter that tweets all the time about one particular thing, and they're really angry about it, and they take it really seriously. And uh, then I go, this person seems like they're really on one about it's like they're they're it's like they come off some people come off like pastors with no no congregation on Twitter. Like they're just shouting these like big sermons or these big threats. And I'm like, you seem like you, you got maybe a little something going on. Yeah. And yeah, and that that brings up yeah, something I was wanting to talk about, which is you know, the most common form of fundamentalism, a mistake that people make is they think that fundamentalism is certainty. That, you know, a fundamentalist is someone who is certain about what they believe. Yeah, and yeah. But I would say that. It's not... Well, technically, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, let's we'll see if you agree with this, that the idea is actually that for neurotic fundamentalism, it's actually repressed uncertainty. That the, it's a reaction formation, is that... I, I, the more angry you are at, so, at somebody who disagrees with you, it, it, there's something that's repressed, some doubt or unknowing within yourself yep. that is being projected out. So actually, um, most of us, when we grow up, we think we know how the world is because we don't know anything different. That's not, we're not fundamentalists. Fundamentalism is not being certain of something. But the point whenever you're confronted with difference and yeah. you close your ears it to it and you it. go like, I don't want to listen... Um, that's when fundamentalism is, arises as a repressed uncertainty. Um, so uh, that's what you see on Twitter sometimes or in social media is when if someone is very angry and fighting something, if they're neurotic, you'll generally find that they're fighting a repressed part of themselves. Yeah. It's projected onto somebody else. Projective identification. So they project mm -hmm. onto the other some, like they're the angry one. They're intolerant. They want to silence. And then the irony is... That's a complex. That would be called a complex in Jungian. In Jungian it? psychology, because <clears throat> complex. Right. Very good. Well, so that that act, the funny thing is for Klein, Melanie Klein, who talks about projective identification. So you project onto somebody else, but then weirdly, if I keep shouting at you and saying you're angry, you're intolerant, you're bigoted, you're trying to silence people. Pete, it's eight a.m. Yes, I know. Yeah, but eventually you'll be going like, I'm not angry. I'm not angry, and then you'll get, I'm not angry, and you'll get angry. And then I'm able to identify with that yep. anger, which is weirdly I'm literally exactly what I was just reading about. Yes. Oh, is that right? Oh, like yeah. The, that would be to complex activating another complex, and then it's a self fulfilling prophecy where you basically aren't seeing someone as they are. You're projecting your own crap onto them. You project that, and in doing so, you they react accordingly. They take on that persona that you're giving them. Neither of you is actually who you are at that point. You're both just, ow, 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 ow. Yes, yeah, And then yeah. later you do it again. And then yeah. the person feels right, which makes it more embedded, and then it continues on and on. Yes, yes. And so for in Kleinian language, that's... So there's projective identification where I put onto you, but you might not actually be triggered by it but if you are it's great because then i identify yeah but if you are triggered it's a projective counter identification where you basically yeah, you you become angry because you're being told you're angry so much and then of course it's great because weirdly i identify with you because 
I'm identifying with the repressed part of myself. Yep. Like there's a part of myself, but it can also be good things. In for Kleinianism is like I might, I might have grown up in an environment where, if I if I shone too much and showed my intelligence, it pissed off my siblings. So I repressed my intelligence. So I look at other people and see them as intelligent, and I project intelligence onto the other. And then if they show that. I like them and I really identify with them, but I'm actually identifying with a part of myself yeah. that is repressed. So it, it goes positively mm-hmm. and negatively, but um, I do find it's, it is interesting how whenever you see someone who's going like, you're angry, you're intolerant, often they want the other to become that so that they can identify themselves externally from themselves. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It, uh, I was also reading similarities to what you're saying with just the uh, being in love is very similar to being uh, in the throes of one of those complexes because you're basically you're not yourself uh you have you have completely uh put on to another person something that is absolutely beyond them uh and you can you know it can still become a love a truly loving relationship where you can see someone closer to what they actually are but the in love state is just uh it's insanity it's like um, it's basically you've lost your mind yes and sometimes the best thing you can have is that where the projection you're putting onto the other person they like it as in they enjoy playing that role in your theatrical performance and you enjoy playing their role in uh, their theatrical performance, role playing, <laughs> um, and that that can be quite nice. Is uh, you're talking about it. role playing? Yes, that's basically because kind of role playing is like a yeah is a very explicit version of kind of what we're always I doing. That's that I think like psychologically, I think that's why we can do role playing. Yes, yeah. you can do role playing because it's already a psychic structure that you're already doing. And the maid outfit just feels nice. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's comfortable. I <laughs> uh, love that. Well, um, yeah, I mean, this has been, I've enjoyed this episode very much. Yeah, me it's too. It's kind of chill. It's a nice little chill episode. How do you guys feel? Did you enjoy it? If you're listening to this, uh, please let us know. Uh, if you'd like to check out patreon.com slash the fundamentalists, we're, uh, we're trying to get this thing improved and better than ever. Because but- once, once we're able to pay for the basic stuff then we'll be paying for the alcohol that's the second level then it gets really good yeah yeah and then the third level is when we get the yeah the yacht um how's your hunger level doing after all that tuna talk you know funny thing is i like i wonder (laughs) if if people can tell my energy is a little bit down but i feel but i'm feeling great like i literally was going to do a one day fast and then it was so easy i was like oh this was easy i used to do them all the time when i was in my 20s just as a kind of a will thing and but i haven't done it for 20 years but like oh it's not bad so today if i can get through today then well um if you want maybe after your your you know i mean i'm pretty i'm immune to the the disease mostly so maybe when you're done we could get a bite to eat somewhere maybe at a food truck oh, i would love that yeah. absolutely okay. that'd be really nice be Sounds outside good. have a nice time um and i just think it'd be funny to see you absolutely starving uh, <laughs> yes i'd be like let's go we gotta get got to eat got eat so you're gonna go three days you can make it three, do three days. days yeah that's awesome man Good and then fourth you. day i just want to do like sushi and salad it's kind of almost a kickstart to just kind of getting more focus and you've and, already forgotten about the fish thing oh yeah that's right oh dear yeah it happens it's crazy yeah, I bought, I, yeah. hey if you let me know if you want any tuna yeah. uh anyway thank you guys <laughs> All right. so much please let us know in the comments what you liked about it and what, and you, what you didn't like about it you tell can us tell us you, you can tell like. us how to improve this you yeah know? we love you goodbye bye-bye